we are going to continue with our class. I've just uh, turned on the recording. It's on. All right. Good. So we are, we are in Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 10. What we said was uh, here in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul is quoting that passage that we just read from the Old Testament scripture. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 14. He's quoting that passage and he's saying, hey, believers, yeah, do the same thing. So very interesting that the truth that God had given to his people under the old covenant through Moses, it's now being extended to us believers in the New Testament. So do the same thing. And so let's just look at it carefully. Romans chapter 10, verses 6 through 10. He says, but the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Or he's saying, look, uh, we people who have received righteousness through faith. Right? So it means uh, we have received God's gift of righteousness. We have faith in God. And this is how we speak. So New Testament people. So he's really talking about you and me, people who have received righteousness through faith. So this is applicable to New Covenant people, New Testament believers. It says the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. So we are supposed to speak in this way. How are we supposed to speak? He says, speak this way. Do not say in your heart, I'm looking at verse 6. Do not say in your heart, who's going to go to heaven to bring Christ down? Very interesting. In Deuteronomy 30, God was saying, the word, don't, tell, don't say, you know, who's going to go to heaven to bring the word of God to me? Here, Paul is using that passage, but he's putting it in the context of the person of Christ. He's saying, don't say in your heart, who's going to go to heaven and have to bring Christ to me? See the parallel. Moses over there in Deuteronomy 30 says, you know, don't say who's going to bring the word of God to me. Here he's saying, Don't talk like that. But verse 8 says, but what does it say? That means now he's, he's saying, look, what does the scripture say? What does Deuteronomy 30 say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. He's quoting from Deuteronomy 30. The word is near you. It's in your mouth and in your heart. And he's saying, in parenthesis, it says, the word of faith which we preach. That means when Moses was speaking, there it was the law, the commandments. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 11, this commandment. But Paul is clarifying. When he quotes Romans 10, 8, when Romans 10, 8, he says, the word is near you in your mouth and your heart. He's clarifying. That word is the message we are telling you, which Paul is preaching, the word of faith. He says, this message that we have been telling you, which is bringing faith to you, this word of faith, the same message is near you. In the Old Testament, Moses said, the book of the law, the commandment. New Testament, Paul is saying this message of the gospel, this message that we are preaching to you about Christ, this message is near you. 
it's in your mouth and in your heart it's in your mouth it's in your heart so this message the word of faith the word of god the gospel the message paul preached and taught the revelation that word of god is in our mouth is in our heart what do we do so here Paul explains in verse 9 and 10 what we're supposed to do. He says in verse 9, if you confess with your mouth. So what's in your mouth? The word. What must you do? Confess. You must say it. Say the same thing. Say what the word says. The word confess. Remember we saw it is homologia. Say the same thing. If you confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart. So what do you do with your heart? The word is in your heart. What do you do with it? You believe with your heart. You confess with your mouth. You believe with your heart. That God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Then verse 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. So when you believe in your heart, it puts you in this place of righteousness, in the right standing with God. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So believing with the heart puts you in a place of righteousness. Confessing with the mouth puts you in a place of experiencing salvation, the work of God. Now, how did he start out this passage? He said, who's going to bring Christ? That means, how am I going to experience Jesus working in my life? How, gonna, how am I going to experience Christ, his healer, his deliverer, his savior, his redeemer? How am I going to experience Christ? Who's going to bring Christ from heaven? Who's going to bring Christ out from the dead? Don't say like that. He's given you his word. You believe it in your heart. You confess with your mouth and you'll experience Christ's work in your life. So I want us to see this passage. It's, it's, it's actually, it was given to the people in the Old Testament. Paul is bringing it for us here in the New Testament. He says, believers, this is it. Now in the Old Testament, it was not a one-off thing. That means God didn't say, just say it once, it's over. No, it's the way you're supposed to live all the time. Similarly here in the New Testament, it's not just a one-off thing. Oh, I have, I have confessed Christ as my savior. No, this is how you live. Every time you want to experience Christ at work in your life. You who have become righteous by faith, you speak like this. You don't speak hopelessness as though Christ is in heaven, he's abandoned you, or Christ is dead, he can't do anything. No, his word is very close to you. It's in your heart, it's in your heart and it's in your mouth. What must you do? You must believe his word in your heart. You must say it with your mouth. When you believe it, it puts you in the right standing of God. You, you, you're there where God wants you to be. When you say it, when you confess it, you're going to experience salvation. You're going to experience Christ doing his work in your life. But it comes through believing his word and saying it with your mouth, confessing with your mouth. So how do I release my faith? I must believe his word. I must say it with my mouth. I declare his word. When I say it, out of a believing heart, I say it. He says, that's when you experience salvation. That is the work of Christ taking place in your life. Is this clear? Go ahead, Divya. Yes, yes, Pastor, thank you. Uh, my question is, uh, sometimes it becomes, uh, you know, hard to believe, you know, the truths uh, in the word. So if a person, but still they try to, you know, confess, uh, you know, try to, you know, maybe just repeatedly declaring the word, though in their heart they are not able to believe. So... Mm. Uh, in that case, how does it work? 
Yeah. So I, I would say my response would be it's a good thing because at least once they start saying the word, they'll eventually come to believe the word. You know, so if they just, you know, if they just, if they just say, saying it like a ritual, you know, okay, I'm, I'm just, you know, reciting something, saying something, or doing something um, meaninglessly. Actually, we're not going to see the result. It's not going to happen. But the good thing is, the good side, good side of it is that. As they keep saying it, they're going to keep hearing the word. And how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing the word. So as they keep declaring that word, it's going to, they're going to come into a place of faith. And, 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 and I've done it, you know, many, many times intentionally. So uh, I, may, I, may be, I may be facing a challenge. And at that time, I'm, you know, I may be feeling very down. You know, uh, you ask me, do you have great faith? Uh, maybe at that time, no. Uh, I, I, you know, I may, I may be very discouraged or very because of all those circumstance situation. It, uh, it's, it's pretty tough. But I choose to speak the word because his word is near me. It's in my heart. It's in my mouth. And. Uh, but as I start doing that, I mean, as I, I'm doing that at that moment, uh, I don't feel great faith. I, uh, my mind is full of questions. It's, it's difficult. But I'm choosing to do it because God said, don't, this is how you're supposed to speak. Faith speaks in this way. We don't speak hopelessness, oh, Christ is over. Jesus, why did you leave me and go to heaven? What are you doing? We don't speak like that. Or we don't speak like Christ is down in the grave. We don't speak hopelessness. We don't speak. But what do we do? We speak the word because the word of faith, which is, that is the New Testament message, it's in our heart, it's in our mouth. That's all I can speak. But at that time, if you ask me, do you have great faith? Huh? No. Why? Because, you know, I'm feeling discouraged. Uh, I may be a little disturbed by what's happening at that moment. Uh, but I'm still going to speak the word. I'll say, God, uh, this is what you have said. This is what your word says. And, uh, you know, I will, I will open my Bible. I will go to those same verses, say it out, read it. Uh, I may not feel great. I may not feel great, strong in faith at that time, but I'm still. Then what happens? As I continue like that, at some point, faith begins to rise in my heart. And these things in my mind, uh, the confusions, the discouragement begins to leave because now I'm beginning to take a hold of that word and the word is taking hold of me right and then i eventually move into this place of i know this is how it's going to be according to god's word okay right? so with the heart man believes unto righteousness so i come I come to that place of right standing i'm in the right place where god wants me to be so how do we come to that place of believing well we've got to hear the word so from that perspective, I would say it's a good thing that they are saying the word. But if they're doing it just as a, uh, you know, just like a vain repetition, then it's meaningless. It's not going to do much good. But if they're doing it as an, with an intent to come to a place of faith, then yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. Any other questions? So what I want to what I want us to understand here is that the confession of the word of God or the confession of our faith or the release expressing our faith through speaking God's word 
is something we see in both the Testaments, Old Testament and New Testament. And very interestingly, this passage from Exod um, Deuteronomy chapter 30, 11 to 14, where God tells through Moses, he tells his people, always speak my word. The Apostle Paul quotes it, and he's telling us, hey, people who have received righteousness by faith, you speak like this. Don't say Christ is so far away. How is he going to help me? Or as a Christ is dead, how is he going to help? No, don't speak like that. The word of God, the word of faith which we are preaching, this message of faith which we are preaching. Speak that. You believe in your heart. You speak it with your mouth. And that's when you'll experience salvation, meaning you'll experience the work of Christ in your life. Right? Let's look at some additional scriptures. So we just focused on uh, these two passages. Uh, we will look at uh, a few additional scriptures here uh, from, from the book of Hebrews. Uh, we'll go to Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Somebody could read that for us, please. Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Jesus Christ. Mm. So here in Hebrews 3, 1, the writer of Hebrews says, think about Jesus. He's pointing to Jesus. He's the apostle and high priest of our confession. And it's it's the same word confession that you know we can trace through the book of Hebrews, uh, which is homologia, confession. And it is used in this context in Hebrews, not about confession of sin, but it's about confession of our faith in Christ and his message or his word. And Hebrews 3.1 is saying, Jesus is the apostle and high priest of our confession. That means, like we said earlier from Matthew 10, 32, 33, here on earth, you and I have a confession. We are saying what we believe. We are speaking what we believe in Christ and in, in, his, in his word. And in heaven, Jesus stands as the apostle. The apostle means the one who's gone ahead of, the one who's gone in front of, so he's gone ahead of, he's gone into the heavens, and he's the high priest. The high priest means he's representing us before the Father. But what is he representing? He's representing our confession. Now, he can only represent our confession if our confession is in agreement with who he is, what he has done, and what he has spoken. If my confession is out of alignment with who he is, with what he has done and what he has spoken, then he can't be the high priest of that confession. He can't represent that confession. So if I confess and say, oh, the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from every sin, well, Jesus can represent that before the Father, indeed. My blood is cleansed from every sin. Why? Because that is true. What Christ has done, and what he has, uh, who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised. But if I confess, oh, the Lord has, uh, you know, kept me in want and left me abandoned me and forsaken me, 
Jesus cannot agree with that. Why? Because Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That's his word. But what am I saying? Ah, oh, he's abandoned me, he's forsaken me. Hey, they're not matching. There's no homologia in this. Because I am saying something that is opposite to what he has said. Then he cannot be the high priest of that. He cannot present that before the Father. He cannot represent that before the Father. Because my confession, what I'm saying, is not aligned to who he is, what he has done, and what he has promised. He said he's the good shepherd. And the good shepherd will never forsake his sheep. But I'm saying, oh, my, my God has forsaken me. My God has abandoned me. He's left me. Oh, it's not right. So, we must understand that when I speak, when I use homologia, my, when my words are in agreement with my faith in who Christ is, what he has done, and uh, uh, what he has spoken, his promises, his word, then my high priest is there in heaven. And that my confession will not fail. Why? Because of the high priest who is in heaven. So we hold fast to the confession. Hebrews 4.14, let's read that. Hebrews 4.14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Hmm. He was for the same, kind of similar to what we read from Hebrews 10, 23. He says, look, we have a great high priest who is in heaven. What must we do? We must hold fast our confession, which is our words agreeing with who Jesus is, what he has done, and what he has promised. He says, we have a great high priest. But I got to hold fast my confession. I can't change my confession of my faith in who he is, what he's done, and what he has said. I can't change it. I shouldn't change it. Right? So hold fast to your confession. Because like Hebrews 10, 23 says, because he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, verse 23 you know, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Hebrews 10, 23. So we have a great high priest who gave us his word. And then we hold fast to that word. The one who promised, one who gave us that word, he's faithful. So, how do we exercise faith? One way is by speaking by speaking the word speaking words right and uh, jesus taught us this right in in mark 11 uh verses 22 to 24 let's just go there one more time uh, uh, and there are parallel scriptures to that in matthew and luke but let's go to mark mark gospel of mark chapter 11 Verses 22 to 24, please. Mark chapter 11, 22 to 24. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For assuredly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Amen. Amen. So Jesus is teaching us. Now, you know, let's try to imagine what actually took place in Mark 11. So imagine yourself. And I, and I think it's nice to do this you know, as we read the Gospels. Imagine yourself as being one of those 12 disciples of Christ, you know, with Jesus. You're walking with Jesus in the Gospels. 
So here we are in Mark 11. You are one of those, each one of us, we are one of those 12 uh, disciples. And uh, uh, you know, they, they've come into Jerusalem. And then from there, uh, they, 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 they would be they were being astonished at his teaching. And uh, so they're, they were from Bethany going to Jerusalem. Okay. So along the way, they saw uh, this is what happened, right? So Jesus, uh, this is a li little earlier in chapter. They've come out of Bethany. They're going to Jerusalem on the road. They're walking. And uh, Jesus sees a fig tree. He's expecting some, you know, he was hoping to find some fruits there. And uh, he found nothing, just leaves. And it was not the season for figs. So in other words, it, he should not have been expecting figs at that time because it wasn't the season of figs. But anyway, Jesus decides to make this a teachable moment, meaning, you know, sometimes we see an object lesson or a practical example. Yeah, he was disappointed. There's no fig on it, but in any way, there's not, there's not supposed to be any fig because it's not the season. But he's going to turn this situation into a teachable moment for his disciples. So he speaks to the fig tree. So, you know, you're right next to him. And what do you hear Jesus say? Fig tree or whatever. I mean, I, we don't know the exact words he used, but no one is going to eat fruit of you ever again. So you, you hear Jesus speak to the fig tree. He's telling the fig tree. Now, that's a little strange because in all your years, in the years that you lived, you never really heard somebody speak like this to a fig tree. But you think Jesus saying, no one's going to eat fruit of you ever again. Hmm. So maybe he said, well, maybe he's just upset, having a bad day. He's just speaking something. Let's go. So... You go off with the crowd, with the, with the team, get into uh, Jerusalem. Jesus finishes preaching there, everything. Next day, you're passing by the same road. And this fig tree has dried up from the roots. Now that's shocking, but that's not, doesn't happen. And so he's saying, you know, like, like the disciples, they said, Lord, look at it. The fig tree you cursed just yesterday is gone. And Jesus says, okay, I want to teach you guys something. And then he gives us these words that, he just, that we just read. He says, here's what I want you to understand. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. So he's talking about faith. He's teaching us about faith. Faith is of the heart. Have faith in God. Faith, you're believing who God is, what he has spoken, what he's done. Have faith in God. And then he said, if you have faith in God, then verse 23, you, can say to the mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And if you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe that what you say will come to pass, you will have what you say. I was just saying, look, the reason I did this, I want to teach you a lesson. And the lesson is this. You have faith in God, and then you speak. Speak your faith. You say those things out with words. And don't doubt in your heart, but believe that the words you are saying will come to pass. And he said, you can speak to the mountain. 
he spoke to a tree. That means he's saying you can speak to things in this natural world, in this natural realm. You speak to those things in this natural realm. Whether it's a fig tree or whether it's a mountain, the things here in this natural realm, you speak to those things with your faith in God. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you're saying will come to pass. He said, you will have what you say. So Jesus taught us, here's one way how to release faith. He, verse 24 is about using faith in prayer, which we will see in a separate lesson. But we're focusing on verse 23. It says, you have faith in God. Then here's how you express your faith. Here's how you release your faith. You speak to things in the natural world. Whether it's a fig tree, whether it's a mountain, whether it's a storm, whether it's the wind and the waves, you speak to things in the natural world with faith in your heart. And don't doubt. He said, it will come to pass. So faith is released in this manner. And, and so he was using this, this moment, converting it or to making it a teachable moment for his disciples. So that's what you and I must learn to do. Now, you know, for us, we have many reservations. You know, how can I speak? You know, how can I speak to circumstances? And what will people think about me? Well, it's okay. Just act on what Jesus words. You, you know, start doing it in your prayer closet, in your private time with God, and say, Lord, I have faith in you. How are you going to have faith in God? By his word. So faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So you take the promise of God. Say, God, this is what you said. And then you speak. You speak the word into your circumstance, into your situation. And he said, don't doubt in your heart. Don't doubt in your heart. Now, like we just discussed a little earlier, sometimes to come to this place where we don't doubt in our heart may take a little time. You know, because like I said, you know, there'll be a lot of things that are, you know, a lot of questions in our mind and a lot of things happen. So it's, it might take us a little time to come to that place where we don't doubt in our heart. But what do you do? Just keep speaking. Because when you're speaking, you're also hearing the word and that word is building faith in your heart. It's moving your heart into a place where you don't doubt in your heart. So he said, if you have faith, you say to this mountain, you speak to the mountain. So that's another thing. You speak to the things in the natural world. And you tell it, tell it what it should do, what should happen. Tell it to move. Tell the circumstance to change. Tell the need to be met. Tell, you know, whatever that. You speak to it. Tell the out, speak your desired outcome over that situation. Don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will be done. Believe that. And he said, you will have what you say. So Jesus taught us to use faith like this, and we need to learn. Your faith is expressed by your words. Your confession of the word releases your faith in God, and you do it. Now, I'm going to share something that's a little personal, but, you know, when I was, this was going back in my early teenage years. Uh, I was in eighth grade in school, so, oh gosh, must have been sometime between 13 to 15 years of age in that range. 8th, ninth, 10th grade, some in those years. You know, uh, in those days, things in my family were not 
very good. It's not, it's not good. And, uh, you know, my parents in those days, uh, there was a lot of problems at home, a lot of problems. And uh, I didn't feel like get coming home many times from school because I knew when I come home, there's going to be a lot of problems. And uh, it was not nice. It was not nice those days. It's very difficult. But at that time, I would go to my room uh, and I would look, take the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33. He blesses the habitation of the just. Proverbs 12, verse 7. The house of the righteous will stand. Um, that's Proverbs 14, 11. Proverbs 15, 6. In the house of the righteous, there is much treasure. Psalm 118, verse 15. In the house of the righteous, there is the voice of rejoicing and salvation. Isaiah 32, 18. My people will live in a peaceful habitation, in a sure dwelling, in a quiet resting place. Then I would also take Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 to 4, where it says Joseph was in the house of Potiphar, and God blessed the house of Potiphar and all that he had for Joseph's sake. So I would take these scriptures and I would go before God. So when there was you know, a lot of turmoil going on in my house, there was fighting and this, that, and I would be in my room by myself. I close the door. There'll be tears going down my face. I said, God, I can't handle this. But you have spoken in your word. The house of the righteous will stand. My family will not fall apart. This house will stand. You have spoken in your word that there will be the voice of rejoicing and salvation. God, right now there is fighting going on. But I declare in my house there will be the voice of rejoicing and salvation. God, you bless my house because I am here. Just like you blessed the house of Potiphar for Joseph's sake. I am in this house. This house is blessed. This house will stand. So, in my room, I was speaking the word. I said, Jesus, you are the high priest of my confession. And I am speaking your word. Your word, this is what your word says. And this is what will happen in my house. And you know, I was just a teenage boy. I was speaking the word in, in my home. My parents were fighting. and Things were happening. It was not nice. And I can tell you this. In four months, four months, things changed. But those four months were difficult. I had to hold on to the word. I said, God, this is your word. It will come to pass. Sometimes things were getting very difficult. Things were tough. But in my room, I was speaking the word. Every morning I'll get up, I'll say, God, this is what your word says. Sometimes even in the evenings when I, I come, when I come back from school and things are not good, go to my room. I say, God, I refuse to accept the situation in my home. Your word says this. This is what I'm going to have in my family. So I spoke the word. So Jesus said, you speak to the mountain. You speak to the situation. Now what must you speak? You must speak your faith in God. What is your faith in God? It's the word. So I said, God, I'm going to have it. I'm going to see it. I can tell you in four months things change. I don't know. I can't explain how things change. All I know is the attitudes changed. The quarreling stopped. Relationships became more civil, more normal, started getting better. But for four months, I just spoke the word, even when things were tough. And I saw the word. 
so today when I tell you, you know, the, the, this is this is how you use your faith, I I can tell you it works. This is this is the way God wants us to do it. And even today, when I fight, today I'm fighting different kinds of battles, other kinds of things that I extend my faith for. But it's the same principle. It's the same thing. That is, have faith in God based on his word, based on what he has spoken, based on his promise. You've got to have faith in God. And then you got to speak to the mountain. you got to speak to the circumstance. you got to speak to the situation. And don't doubt in your heart. So, like I said, sometimes you keep doing it. You keep speaking the word. Why? Because you need to come to that place where you don't doubt in your heart. You don't doubt in your heart. But you believe that what you say will come to pass. And you will have what you say. It will come to pass. So, this is something that we do. Let's uh, let's see now. Let's uh, okay. I don't think this is a little bit more here. Okay, um, we will pick this up next week. I think we'll stop here for now. Let me see if you have any questions on the chat. Any? Uh, any questions here? Okay. All right. Um, Okay, quest, uh, the scripture. So uh, all the scriptures, can you please? Sure. Uh, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33. Chapter 12, verse 7. Proverbs 14, verse 11. Proverbs 15, verse 6. And so all these scriptures are from Proverbs. Then Psalm 118, 15. Isaiah 32. Uh, what did I say? Asia 32, 18, I think. Let me just cross-check that. Sometimes I get a little, sometimes I forget a little bit. Asia 32, verse 18, yes. Then we also did Genesis 39, verse 2 to 4. Yeah. Yeah. So you could use these scriptures. I, uh, these are all scriptures concerning the family and so on. Uh, yeah. So you got to hold on to the word. Let faith be in your heart based on the word. You speak the word. Don't doubt in your heart. and God will fulfill it. Right? So... And this was a teenage boy, right? I said, like, I was 13 years of age, 13 to 15, between my 8th to 10th grade. So something like that, if my calculus, if I, my memory serves me right. But it's, uh, it was during that those years. And uh, God did that. God did it, right? So anything, anything in the Bible, any promise in the Bible, he said, the word is near you. That means all of it, all the scriptures. Okay, whether it's for your family, whether it's for healing, whether it's for whatever area of life we face, right? You take the word. The word is near you. The word of faith, that means this is God's word. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart for you to believe it. It's in your mouth for you to speak it. And then you don't doubt but you believe that what you're saying will come to pass. Jesus said, you will have what you say. Now, uh, why did it take four months? I don't know. Why does something take a little longer than others? I don't know, except that I can say, look, it takes a little bit of time for us to come to that place where you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe. So just keep doing it. Just keep looking at the word. Uh, just let his word be in your mouth and in your heart. Just stay with it. Stay with it. Don't, quit. Don't give up. 
and you will see uh, how this can come to pass. Okay. Uh, okay, one question here before we close. Can we also declare regarding supernatural childbirth, painless delivery? Is the curse of pain during delivery also taken up at the cross? Any comments on the book Supernatural Childbirth by Jackie Mize? Um, yeah, I haven't read that book. Uh, my, uh, you know, the book you're referring to Supernatural Childbirth by Jackie Mize. So uh, I, I don't know what's all in the book. But um, if you ask, you know, if you ask about that painless to live, believe in God for it, but yeah, why not? Just believe God that uh, uh, that the curse of pain uh, will not be there and you pray for that uh, and, and, and expect God for a supernatural child, but yeah. So my, my response is this, I haven't read the book, so I can't comment about the contents of the book. But I, what I can say is yeah, definitely we can believe God uh, for that, for a painless delivery and believe God that there won't be that pain and just speak blessing over the child and over the delivery and so on. Okay. Um, yeah, just, you know, anything that's causing See, um, uh, I like to use the scripture and just uh, I see Shani's question about period pain. You know, what, uh, one thing is first, if you just go with me very quickly uh, to First Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, uh, I know we have just three more minutes before we get, close, get to close. But uh, I just want us to look at verse 13 first. I'm looking at First Corinthians chapter six, verse thirteen. Okay, um, it tells you know, of course, Paul here is talking about uh, the body and sin, and on, so on. Okay, so he says, First Corinthians six thirteen: foods for the stomach, stomach for foods. God will destroy both it and them. The body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body, okay? Now he's saying the body is not for sexual immorality. That means the body is not for sin, but the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. So just focus on that second part of that verse. The body is for the Lord. The Lord is for the body. So, for each one of us as believers, our body is for the Lord. It's not for sin. It's not for sickness. It's not for pain. It's not for anything else. It's for the Lord. And the Lord, who is he? He is Jehovah Rapha. He is creator. He is for my body. So when the Lord is for my body and Jehovah Rapha is for my body, what should I expect in my body? I should expect healing for my body. So whatever the condition is, right? Whatever the situation, pain, sickness, Lord, this body is for you and you are for my body. Jehovah Rapha is for my body. So I'm expecting all that comes from Jehovah Rapha to be given to my body. Is that okay? Okay. We will pause here today. We will pick this up next week. We'll go forward. So we are learning one way, the first way to express faith, which is through words, right? And there are other ways which we will cover, like we said, through prayer, through the praise praise and worship, through action, all these ways. These are different ways to express faith. Um, let's close in prayer, please. I know our time is up. Uh, we need to 
take a break and go for our next class. Somebody could quickly close in prayer for us, please. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for the word that you had taught us, Lord. We pray that you would be able to apply this in our life and continue to declare your word and what you have spoken over our lives into our circumstances, Lord, and help us to grow in faith and to see miracles happening in our way, God. Thank you for this time. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. See you again next week. Okay. Bye now.